guys, today we're going to be talking about Fedora 39. In my most recent video, I gave it a really hard time by saying it's very much a beta project. In reality, the project itself is not bad. It was simply more the fact of the philosophy behind it is not something I can support. I don't think giving the consumer essentially your beta source code for your project that's down the line is necessarily fair. But I also did want to give it an honest chance. So today we're going to go and throw it in a VM and we'll see how this goes. First, we're going to go ahead and start over on the Fedora website. Absolutely wonderful. Everything's organized neatly. It's done very well. So if you look here, I'm going to go ahead and download the latest ISO image right here. All right. See, as you can see here, I just downloaded a few minutes ago as well. Try to make sure you don't have to wait on it. So see that it's obviously it's working and it does just fine. I'm going to minimize this. And then I'm going to go ahead and get us all set up in a VM. So as you can see, we are now in VirtualBox. I'm going to go ahead and go up, hit the plus sign, hit install from file, and go to the ISO image I downloaded earlier. I'll go ahead and go through, just like any other installation. I'll leave a name Fedora for the sakes of this video. And then go ahead and make sure it's under UEFI because I don't know why anybody would be using a BIO setting in 2023. I have 64 gigabytes of RAM on this machine, so I'm going to go ahead and give about half that at 32 gigs. Just so I can, there's no way that it could be all my hardware, right? I'm going to go ahead and go to storage limitation or limits, and then go ahead and give it approximately 100 gigabytes of storage, as I have a one terabyte NVMe drive for a boot drive. I'm going to hit create. I'm going to deny the inhibiting shortcuts because of the fact we are just doing it for this video. Let's go ahead and hit test this media to make sure the ISO is just fine. As you can see here, it's actually one of the better things about Fedora that I really do support, that they allow you to test your media, which is really smart, and I don't know why OpenSUSE or other distributions don't do that. You can see here, it's just going through. It's going through the checking process. It takes not even a minute to do, so you might as well go ahead and check it. Better than having a corrupted install by potentially. As you can see here, it's mounting everything. It's starting each service. It's doing what it needs to do, which is absolutely what it should be doing, and it's great, and I'm super, super excited to get into this system. Let's see here in just a moment what it looks like. Okay, it has went ahead and got in. Let me go ahead and make sure to full screen this for you. Okay, so you can see it says, Welcome to Fedora, which this is actually a pretty clean screen. It looks a lot like my OpenSUSE setup does, believe it or not, because I do GNU GNOME, right? It, this is the installation ISO that we're booted into right now. It's using the default GNOME app applications. What we can see here, yeah, it does not include the games like I mentioned on the OpenSUSE video, which is for the better in my personal opinion. Um, let's go ahead and now go into the installation process. All right, here we are. It's loading up, and if you can see here, they use the Anaconda installer, which from what I've been doing in terms of reading, they're eventually going to have a new version of that to replace all of this. It's supposed to come out in one of the 40 versions from what I was reading a while back. So if you look here, you can go ahead and choose which language you want to use. You can use which dialect of that language you want to use. We'll go ahead and hit continue here. And then we will go ahead and look here. This is actually a pretty simple and good portion of the installation process. In fact, they're making it where you can choose your keyboard layout makes things so much easier because even in just the United States, there are different variants of the QWERTY keyboard, which is really nice. So if we go ahead and go into time and date, right, this is detecting my region in the United States that I am in. So that's correct. But if let's say you had to, you just double click, type it in, and it would drop down menu and select it. I'll hit done. Then you'll go ahead and go into the installation destination. This is where I get a little bit not so happy about the Anaconda installer. It took me a while to figure out how this works. 
So if you go here, you can make it where you install it to a network drive. Okay, simple enough. But then you see the storage configurations for if you do it in your standard drive. So let's say we go to custom, right? And then we go ahead and hit done. All right, it's a GUI, which is nice. But now it says all of these options, right? I would just simply hit better FS if I'm going to make an option. But here is what's really nice. Let's say if you have Apple hardware and you're trying to install it, you have to use this option. It'll help you create some of the stuff by itself. I don't know how it does this though, which is kind of interesting. So let's just say we let it do its thing, right? Go ahead and just hit done. We go ahead and hit accept changes and now it's ready, ready to go. Then we go ahead and hit begin installation. With it being an RPM based distribution, the installation process does take a little bit. And I recommend you have an inter internet connection whenever you do this installation for the fact of it'll go ahead and download the updates for the installation so you don't have to do it after the fact. Just like how it would, and let's say, open through the tumbleweed. So this is going to take a while. I will go ahead and cut out the portion in between during just this installing software portion until something else pops up. So now we are at the installation of the bootloader section. So this only took approximately seven minutes or so on my machine. It wasn't too bad. The big thing is, I wish they would show a little bit better. And so we mentioned somewhere that it might take a while, as you see in other installers. Really interesting that they don't. Yes, they have this bar, which shows this long thing. But if you're used to how once distributions install, typically your bootloader is the last thing that gets installed. So this should not take very much longer. So as you can see here, it's generating the init RAM FS, right? So something to note that's the same in RPM distributions from what I've been able to see is that they both use some type of form of bracket or something along those lines. So this is about to do its thing, about to make it where we can boot into it after the installation. Something that would absolutely amaze me is one day if one one of these distributions that just has a small amount of words saying this is what's going on, if they would go in and explain or have, you know, a drop down menu of some sort so we can watch what's happening. Because I know for a fact that when I look at something along those lines, it doesn't always make sense because, oh, well, post installation scripts. All right, I understand you're running scripts. But what scripts are you running? They don't go into detail, which I, that might just be a personal preference of mine. If you look here, I did go ahead and finish. We're going to go ahead and hit finish installation, which with the Fedora installer, this, this it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know why you would want to stick in the ISO image. But you actually have to manually reboot, as you can see here. You actually have to go here, hit the power off button, and then hit restart. Why doesn't it just auto reboot like every other installer? I, I don't understand the choice. All right, we will go ahead and click back on the Fedora VM. And as you can see here, it's using the standard GNOME boxes boot up process per se. I'm going to go ahead and full screen this once again. I'm going to go ahead and go through the main setup that we're all pretty used to at this point, but it's been customized a little bit for Fedora. So we're in obviously Fedora and Home. So we're gonna go ahead and see that it says, welcome to Fedora Linux 39. The setup will guide you through making an account and enabling some features. We'll have you up and running in no time. We'll hit next. I don't know if you guys are the type of people to enable location service or not. I don't typically care for automatic problem reporting that does matter to me because right if we're going to use someone's product that costs absolutely nothing why don't we just give them back that little bit of data they do need that to try to make their project better go ahead and hit next this is a very very important step 
just like how in other RPM distributions, you do have to enable the non-free repositories, which they're calling third-party repositories here. That's very, 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 very important if you want to use things like Discord uh, or any other proprietary-based software. So go ahead, or even things like your CPU drivers, right? If you're using an Intel chip for some of them, depending on which series you have. So go ahead and hit enable third-party repositories. You'll go ahead and hit next. Next, we're gonna go ahead and go to connect your online accounts. I don't know if it, many of you from the FOSS space are against Google, which I know I'm not a huge fan of the company, but I understand the necessary portions of, you know, being on YouTube, that type of stuff. So I could understand if you're to hook it up here in the online account section. Next Cloud, I know many of us will host our own Next Cloud servers. You can go ahead and connect to here, or you can use one of their domain uh, partners, or then you can connect to Microsoft's accounts. That almost seems blasphemous to me personally. I know a lot of people jump from to Linux to get away from Microsoft, so I'm a little confused why they decide to add them as a partner here. I know many distributions do it. I wonder on what account they made that decision. Next, we'll go ahead and hit skip. All right, now it's time to make our user. This is obviously an OEM installer. So we'll go ahead and type in a name for this. I'll put Sprungles. And then we'll go ahead and type it in for the username as well, which I'm perfectly okay with that. I can hit and edit the icon if I want. A lot of the default ones you typically see, I'll go ahead and select this one for the sake of this installation. Go ahead and hit next. Now for my super secret password, that's definitely not one, two, three, four. Okay, you will see that it's giving a warning that it's a weak password. That's great. I think more distributions need to have something like that. It makes it where, yes, it still gives users the option for a weak password if they are just quickly just spinning up a VM or something along those lines. But for those that are going to be using as a daily driver, please don't set your password as one, two, three, four. Now go ahead and hit next again. Now we're done through the installer. It wasn't too bad. It was pretty step by step. It's pretty foolproof to say the least. I'm going to hit start using Fedora Linux. We'll see it's very uh, Doc Gnome-like. It took a second to load in here. We'll go ahead and see that it says, Welcome to Gnome 45. So it's running on Gnome 45. That's great. And from what I understand, this is a full Gnome 45. They do not do the thing like Ubuntu does and hold back packages to make a mishmash type of experience. So we're getting a full stock Gnome 45 experience. We can go ahead and take the tour for the sake of this video, see what it's like. Why not? So we're going to go ahead and hit the start tour for the GNOME. This is probably better that they do this for people that are used to reading documentation so they can learn how to do things. So we'll go through here. We'll get an overview. Cool. Cool. Just type to search. Nice. We'll see keeping on top with workspaces. That's really nice. We'll see up and down for, let's say you're using a laptop. This portion is actually pretty incredible. I've used it on a laptop before. It's Mac OS type gestures, from what I remember. It was pretty great, and it really does make it a lot more intuitive if you're using a touchpad. Okay, and we have left and right for workspaces, which is just another shorthand for if you're using laptops. That's it. Have a nice day. Oh, great, great. I'm glad. And, you know, it's such an upbeat attitude to have during an installation or during an opening process like that. Then we'll go ahead and go to the app drawer right here. And we'll see it's a very, very stock GNOME 45 experience. Just like I was saying for the ISO image, you can see here that they have basically just all the standard GNOME app applications that you would like, such as your GNOME terminal, boxes, system monitor, settings. We have LibreOffice installed, which is not a GNOME application, but is a definitely a necessary tool. If you're on Linux, you need to do word editing, Excel spreadsheets, those type of things. But we have maps, which from what I understand with this, it's basically just a wrapper to make it where you can go in and look at different things. It's not comparable to Google Maps, really. It's nowhere close to the same quality, but oh well, no big deal. It's a great alternative if you just need basic things. 
if we're going to go keep going, we'll see there's contacts, which is just our standard GNOME contacts application. We'll go ahead and click on the Fedora Media Writer, which is one of their better tools, and I actually really recommend, even if you're not going to flash Fedora. It's just an ISO file writer, just like Popsicle or anything along those lines, except for they have an option to download the Fedora ISO instead of having to go to the website and download it yourself, which is actually pretty great. I'm really, really glad they have that option here. Uh, we'll go ahead and hit next, right? So let's say we wanted to make a thumb drive, right? You can go through the different versions, emerging editions, which there's different kinds, like Fedora Silver Blue, kind, kind of light, Fedora Onyx. I've not even heard of this part of one before, so I'm definitely going to start looking into that. And we have the spins, which are like KDE Plasma, Budgie, so on and so forth, as you can see right here. Labs are other things from more of a educational type stuff. So we'll go ahead and close out of this and we'll go ahead and take a look at what else the GNOME experience offers us. See if they've done anything in the settings men menus. Let's go to the about. As just like any other distribution, they went ahead and customized it to say it's Fedora. Um, everything else looks pretty similar and average among the GNOME experience. So they haven't heavily customized this, which is probably for the better. So this is honestly Fedora 39. It's it's pretty stock, it's pretty great. And then let me go ahead and before we close off here, open up a terminal and show you something about DNF. I mentioned DNF in the OpenSUSE video and it's pretty important to talk about how great of a package manager this is. So let's say do sudo DNF update, right? to update our packages. We'll go ahead and put in our super secret password. That's definitely not one, two, three, four and go ahead and go through. You will see here that there's something called a copper repo. So a copper repo is very similar. It's like an AUR almost sort of. It's closer to like an OPI, which is over on OpenSUSE though. The big thing to note that's not the same about the copper versus let's say the AUR is the copper is mainly for like Python projects, more like developer projects, whereas AUR, the AUR is typically more for your average normally to go over there and download things, right? A lot of things on this copper, unless you're really into programming and really into Linux, you're not gonna really know what it is. Then you look past that, we'll go ahead and see that we have the standard repos, but you'll also notice something pretty peculiar about the Fedora installation or at least during this update process, that once I can scroll up, but you'll see here, it's very specific, the OpenH264 from Cisco repo. So there was actually an issue with FFmpeg a couple of years back with Fedora that caused hardware acceleration to be broken. And that had to do with licensing. So that's kind of interesting. I'm wondering if this is here because of that, trying to basically say somebody paid for the licensing which this would be Cisco in this situation. And then we, for some weird reason, it drives me a little bit bonkers, but if they're gonna be all about, oh, you have to enable your non-free out of the box, why do we have a Google Chrome repo? Why couldn't we just compile it from source if we really wanted to use Google Chrome? Like, if you go to Linux, at least I, I know from my space of people, I don't typically wanna use Google Chrome. That's just taking all of the telemetry they want. It's horrible on RAM usage. And if you want a Google Chrome-like experience, just use Chromium and has all the same plugins, all the same capabilities. And you usually get updates just a little bit faster too. I don't know why they would do that. Then as we saw earlier, when we enabled the non-free repos, which they call third-party repos, we see RPM Fusion for Fedora 39 non-free NVIDIA drivers. So yeah, it's actually pretty easy to install the NVIDIA drivers on here if you are using an NVIDIA graphics card. I am not in this instance, so I'm not gonna go through that. And then we have Steam. It's, it's amazing that a distribution has a Steam repo. They clearly aren't putting it in their main repo, and I'm wondering why does it need its own thing? Why couldn't it just be out of every other non-free thing? Just be thrown in there, or just allow the person to install it? Yeah, it's just interesting how they do things in terms of repos. So if we scroll down right for the update, we have our kernel is going to update to 6.6.8. So it is using the latest kernels, which is really nice, which is probably for the better. 
depending on your hardware. Um, but we'll see here, it does use Network Manager for your network communication, which that makes sense as well. We'll see AMD GPU firmware. I don't know why it's pulling that, because this is an VM. But yeah, you'll see the rest of this is has all the Google fonts installed by default. That's a little bit weird because those are proprietary. I've always kind of wondered why they would do that. Why wouldn't they just use the Libra fonts in place of that? And we go down and down and down. You see that there's a lot going on here. So the other thing that I mentioned in the other video is how many options they give you. Fedora actually does this a little bit better. They give you two different options. Yes or no? That's it. At least for simple installation props, things like this. You say yes, or you do its thing. Something else to note, this has parallel downloads enabled by default. So this is going to go significantly faster than something like, let's say, Zipper, or even Apt. Because it's just downloading it all at once. The installation process is still going to be the same speed, of course, because that just really comes down to how many threads you have. And we'll go ahead and let this do its thing in the background, of course. But wait, how do you minimize it? That's something interesting about GNOME in general, right? You don't just see a minimize or full screen button over here. No, no, you have to go here to the overview, go down, and click it once. Oh, or did they change that behavior in this? Oh, wow, they did. I wonder if it's a right click now. No, there is no way to minimize this window without going and opening GNOME Tweaks and enabling it. That seems to be an oversight on my personal opinion. It's pretty crazy that I can't minimize my window when I just want to minimize my window. Okay. Wow. Anyways, go ahead and hit yes, and we'll go ahead and install. We'll keep the key imported as well. But yeah, overall, Fedora is not bad for what it is. What it really comes down to for me is a philosophical thing. Fedora is sponsored by Red Hat, and I am not the biggest fan of Red Hat these days because of some of the decisions they've made, which those decisions were 100% protected under the GPL. Look at how fast this is upgrading. I've, I've seen how optimized Fedora is for what it is, and I love it for that. But again, I can't use this if it has basic functionality issues, like I just can't minimize a window. That's pretty nuts to me. There's absolutely no reason why by default I should have to go open up a third-party utility that's not even technically supported anymore and minimize using that by enabling a custom extension. Again, this is not Vidora's fault. This is actually based off of the GNOME Foundation because they make GNOME. But at the same time, why would you support a desktop environment that doesn't have that basic functionality? Anyways, that's what Fedora is. Let's go ahead and go take a look at the documentation. See how it is in comparison to other projects. You are a super secret password. You want to force shut down the machine. We'll go ahead and go out of boxes. As you can see here, they do have a documentation and they actually recently updated it. It looks pretty great. I would argue I like the way the open the one works a little bit better, but oh well, no big deal. Uh, let's say we look at the same kernel, right? It gives you quite a few different options from a drop down menu, which seems like an interesting choice to say the least. But there are a lot of options, and it almost seems like these are just a popular things that people have looked for. I, I wish they would just make it where it goes to a single page that explains about the project rather than something random that's like installing kernel from Koji, which this is basically getting it from another repo that is ahead of other stuff. Then you have building a custom kernel. Okay, cool. I can understand that if you have proprietary based hardware, you have manually upgrading the kernel. Cool. We have different options here. Then you look here and you look at this design. It's kind of interesting. You have your Fedora Linux, which is what we just used, Fedora server. Okay, cool. That's it almost a little bit overlapping with some of the other products that Red Hat has. 
but I'm not going to push that too hard. They are separate entities. You know, our core S, a minimal container-based operating system designed for clusters. So definitely your enterprise stuff there. Fedora IoT, they'll be great for home labs. We have spins and labs. So this is something pretty interesting, but I do want to start with the emerging Fedora desktops first. So let's look here. Oh wait, what? There's only two options? Why did they make an entire tab for just two options? They could have simply just put that there in two different little columns. Okay, well, let's go ahead and go to Fedora Silverblue. Fedora Silverblue, from what I'm understanding, is basically a mutable version of Fedora. Okay, cool. Some people are going to use it, some people won't. But the weird and almost weird, like, crazy thing about this, these both are immutable. One's just GNOME, one's just KDE. What, why are they two separate ISOs? Okay, I guess there's some type of reason. Because they have almost identical descriptions with the only difference as being their desktop environment. And if you go back to what a lot of people have been saying these days is why you shouldn't make an ISO just for a different DE. But okay, they're welcome to do what they like. Then we go back and we go to the spins. Okay, same same thought process. We have a bunch of different DEs, but from what I remember and what I've used in terms of Fedora's spins before, they have different customizations on top of those DEs, and they've done a little bit of work for optimization. That's where it's a little bit different, at least for their spins. I've used quite a few of them. There are KDE. There is obviously the standard GNOME, but that's not a spin. We have an XFCE Cinnamon, Mate Compiz, Fedora i3. If you're a window manager person, use this. It's great. LXQT if you're on a very, very old system, but you don't want to use a window manager. We have LXDE, which is the predecessor to LXQT. Then we have Fedora Solas. I've never even bothered to try to use this. It honestly intimidates me. Then we have Fedora Fosh. Wow, they are supporting phones. Interesting. Okay, that's new. I didn't know that existed. There's Fedora Sway, which Wayland. We have Fedora Budgie, which is also a great desktop environment, which is originally done by their project. And then we have our Fedora Labs. So this is used for more professional work. We look here, we have astronomy, which is, of course, you're out of space. You're know, exploring the brain, which is called neuro. That sounds pretty fascinating. Let's see what that is. So it's a plethora of free for neuroscience and one easy to use downloadable image. So this is for research. Wow, this is so cool. Um, then we have a design suite for those artists out there, games for those who want to game, which is interesting, jamming, music. This is definitely where you want to learn Python, security labs, like if you're a security researcher, robotics, if you're a robotics engineer, and then there's just other scientific computing. So, as you can see here, there's a large, large difference between OpenSUSE and Fedora on a philosophical level. In my personal opinion, what I'm just going to start saying for now on is that Fedora and OpenSUSE are similar projects but the Fedora is more of your business type of experience, whereas OpenSUSE would be more of your community, let's have fun type of thing that just happened to be backed by a large company named SUSE. So I did want to go ahead and wrap up this video and say thank you for watching. I really appreciate you being here. As always, my DMs are open, I'm always available, and if you need anything at all, Please hit me up over on Discord. Don't forget to please comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.